Welcome to the Property Management Mastermind Show with your host, Brad Larson. Brad owns one of the fastest growing property management companies in San Antonio, Texas. This podcast is for property managers by property managers. You'll hear from industry leading professionals on best practices, new ideas, success stories, and lessons learned. This is your opportunity to learn about the latest industry buzz surrounding property management, as well as tips and strategies to improve your business. Now here's your host, Brad Larson. Hello everyone, this is Brad Larson, host of the Property Management Mastermind Podcast. To see a complete list of the offers and discounts we have worked to provide, visit our website at propertymanagementmastermind.com. In there, you will find additional discounts from Tenant Turner, Citizen Home Solutions, PMW Websites, and several others. Also be sure to check out our Seminar and Conferences tab, where we highlight different conferences going around the country business and property management related. Lastly, be sure to seek out the Facebook group we have started and become a member. In that group, the PM community at large, to include vendors, are welcome to join. Hey everyone, this is Allison DeSaro with Seacoast Commerce Bank. You may have heard about us, or you may have even heard my podcast episode with Brad Larson, where we discuss the benefits of banking with property management bank like Seacoast Commerce Bank. We specialize in providing the ideal banking partnership for not only your business, but specifically your trust accounts. In addition, we offer a significant analysis program, which allows us to not only offset your bank fees, but then also offset property management related invoices. You can visit us at our website, or you can call me directly at 61 61- This is Brad Larson, and I endorse this message. Hey, everyone. Brad Larson here. In today's interview, I have Derek Scott. And Derek is uh, an acquaintance of mine that I've known for quite some time. I've been bumping into him at the NARPM conferences. Started to get to know him really well because he's a property management company owner and an insurance company owner with 25 years plus experience in the insurance industry realm. So he definitely knows the insurance business in and out especially how it applies to us property managers in working with owners, working with tenants, and working with company stuff that you need to have for insurance for your own companies. And so I think it's a good interview because we're going to touch on top to bottom. We're going to dive in deep into the master policy concept, which is something I really want you to focus on is learning how to do the master policies in addition to how it relates to pets in screening and leasing of all things, right? So it's it's one of those things that I wanted to dig into it with them because I wanted to understand it more. And I think what we talk about will definitely benefit you in understanding how you can apply these techniques into your business. So it's a great interview with Derek and let's have a listen. And welcome everybody to another episode of the Property Management Mastermind Show. I'm your host, Brad Larson. And today's guest is Mr. Derek and he's gonna be talking to us about insurance. So Derek, give us a couple minutes and introduce yourself. Thank you, Brad. I appreciate the opportunity to be on the show. Um, my name is Derek Scott. I'm in Tulsa, Oklahoma, and I've been in the insurance business for 25 years. Uh, for most of that time, I was with Farmers Insurance, nationally recognized company. And then um, after the 20 years with Farmers Insurance, I opened up an independent insurance agency called uh, Insurance Management Group. And, you know, 25 years of dealing with personal lines customers, uh, high net worth individuals, small businesses, and over the last five years really have been dealing with investors of single family rentals and apartment complexes. The big reason we have you on today, as I mentioned in the intro, is you are a property management company owner. So you and your partner own a property management company of single family homes. Uh, Tracy Strike is his name and I talk to you guys on a, on a regular basis about property management related stuff, but I'm really starting to come to learn that you're such an expert on the insurance game that I wanted to bring you on the show to talk specifically about how insurance and property management go together, because it's not just a regular real estate transaction. There's so many things involved in property management. We have a business insurance, we have tenant type insurance, we have owner type insurance, and we have all the stuff that goes around owning a business because you have potentially commercial insurance for owning your own building all these things are going to come into play. And so I made a list of stuff that we and I want to touch on. And so the first thing I want to get into is we talk about the master policy concept and where the renter's package is, you have landlord insurance and some of the things, how they're going to tie together. So uh, to kind of give you a quick intro, everybody, and this is part of a campaign I'm working on now with in our own office, our own property management company is we're, we're wanting to open up to rent to pets of all types because 
currently as we stand, we're discriminating against pit bulls and German shepherds and Akitas and chows and, and those types of pets. And so it goes to a deeper side because this may be a long explanation. Derek, I'm going to bring you in here real quick is to be able to open it up to rent to potentially more of those types of animals. We have to look at first the landlord insurance and we'll talk about that. And then the renter's insurance as well. Mm-hmm. And all that could be tied into a master policy. So to break that down real quick, let's, let's focus on one of those things. Let's focus first on the renter's package master policy concept. So kind of tell me what you think about this, uh, the management company owner having a master policy and passing along uh, the types of insurance basically to the tenants on a mandatory type basis. So talk me through some of this. Okay, so being in the property management business and having in the insurance business. In the insurance business, our, our, my job is you have a problem and then you try to provide a solution. Well, being in the property management business, the problem is from an administrative standpoint and the time and the effort and the money that goes into making sure that your renters have renters insurance. Liability. That's a big thing because a lot of us do mandate renter's insurance in our lease agreements. However, as you just mentioned, the time and allocated to policing that is nearly impossible because you you can spend a lifetime. uh, Here's the thing. Everybody knows this and I'm going to reiterate it, but you can put in your lease agreement that we are requiring you to have renter's insurance. The renters will sign off on it. They'll show you a copy of the renter's insurance. Then they'll walk out and cancel it. (laughs) Right. Absolutely. Or you'll, you'll rent to them and they say, Oh yeah, I'll get it. And then they don't get it. Are you going to kick them out? Probably not. Right. I mean, it's just, yeah, yeah, it it just makes for a really tough situation. So the concept would be uh, having a master policy to where, the management company themselves, the corporation and or the individual owners of the management company are the insured. Is that correct? Right. So that's the, the, I'm going to jump back a little bit because the first problem is the administrative standpoint to make sure that your owners are properly protected, that the property management's properly protected, that the renters have liability insurance. The second problem is, and you alluded to this, are pets because so many tenants have pets, right? So if they don't have renter's insurance and the problem is making sure that they have renter's insurance, then you don't have necessarily the coverage that you would want as a property manager or you'd want for your owners, okay? The second problem is people, if they do get renter's insurance, not all the companies cover vicious dogs. They don't cover dog bites right? Some Mm -hmm. companies do, some companies don't. It's all over the place, okay? So to make sure that they have renter's insurance that covers vicious dogs, okay? Um, And to make sure that you are decreasing your costs and your time and your efforts and protecting your owners, you want to make sure that they have renter's insurance. And the best way to do that is to have a master policy in place, right? And it's easy to put in place. And it looks like this. Brad Larson RentWorks has a master renters policy that covers tenants legal liability, covers contents for the tenant, and it covers bodily injury and property damage liability for the tenant. So it's a win for the tenant and for the owner. Okay. So that's four levels of coverage. So go through that real quick because I want to break that down so everybody understands this. It's typically an X dollar amount in tenant liability insurance. 100000 100000 It's going to be a debatable amount, depending on how high you want your premium to have for renter's content coverage, which is basically renter's insurance. Yep. Okay, so that's included. And then you have bodily injury at a, a, a rate to be determined. That could be 10000 20000 whatever you decide. Right. And you had one more in there. What was the fourth one? Uh, well, it's property damage liability. Property damage. So right. it's, it's, yeah, it's property damage liability and there's medical payments. So you have really five levels of, of insurance. Nice. Because that's, that's a lot. Cause we're, we're, we're the, the dilemma is anybody can go into a lot of the softwares right now or some of the third parties out there and get tenant liability insurance very quickly. And it's in, in certain softwares, it's a press the button and you have tenant liability insurance for your tenants. However, it's only, it's only limited in coverage 
And some would argue, and I don't want to get into this road, but some would argue that it's more slanted towards the owner, but the tenant's paying for it. Some yep. would argue that. And so where I'm going with this is this protection, this particular protection is actually going to have several of those layers that offer the renters specific coverage. And that's kind of a change in the mindset. And it's really neat because the, the implementation of it is across the board. I mean, it's, you don't have to do the opt in opt out thing because if is if you disclose it up front, you put it into a lease agreement, you can basically uh, inform the tenants that this is what we're providing right. you. Right. And it could be at cost for a package. Yeah. And so like a, like a resident benefits package, for example, uh, you could include those things that we just mentioned with the insurance, all that under the master policy, you fall under the master policy. I'm the insured. You're the, 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 I'm just the lucky one that gets underneath it. Then you can include your admin fees and your payment fees and your portals and your, and your 24 seven maintenance. And, you know, you may have a couple of goodies you want to throw in there to the tenants. You might have, you know, free dry cleaning or whatever you can come up with. Those things are going to play into that resident benefits package that we're putting together. And, and you and I have been in discussion about this quite a bit about putting this exact thing together in our business. Mm -hmm. I'm just loving it because to me, it's step one of the bigger campaign of moving towards allowing, uh, allowing our leasing department to rent to, uh, rent to those marginal breeds. And so a great example is we turned down a military couple about a month ago and the guy had great credit score. They were a nice couple uh, and they're active duty military and they had a one year old German shepherd. Okay. I know it's not the end of the world, but because of the insurance requirements that are put onto the owners, we had to deny them. And so let's transition into talking about the landlord stuff, the homeowners insurance stuff, because if that homeowner did not have that type of a policy to say that, that would say, you can't rent to these lists of breeds. We've all seen those, those lists out there that you can't reach, rent to the, the pit bulls and the Akitas and the chows and the, 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 the mixes, the huskies, the German shepherds, mm -hmm. uh, you know, the Doberman pinchers, the, any of those working type animals we can't rent to. And so that's, that's kind of a rotten deal. And that's a great example of, of that, uh, that, that one-year-old German shepherd for that active duty military couple. And that just kind of broke our heart. And we're just looking at other ways to figure this out the restriction on us, and then I'm going to let you go, and I'll let you talk about this, is the landlord's homeowner's insurance dictates that we cannot allow those pets into the home. And there's an alternative for that. So let's talk through this. Okay. So, uh, and, and on the, I'm going to backtrack just a bit. Going into all the property management um, conferences, uh, NARCOM conferences, one of the misconceptions is tenant legal liability that they can click on like you were talking about from the software standpoint okay is that that is renter's insurance and it's not right, right, right. and i i feel like our job um, is to protect the owner and and provide as much value to the tenant as possible and that's what the master policy does right so mm -hmm. it actually is providing if you're going to charge the tenant for it, you want to have value to them. And that's really important. Great. Right? Point. I totally I mean, agree. And that's why we're is. looking at this in, in sincereness to implement right away. I think this has a lot more value to the tenants and, and you're right. So go on from there. And, the, and so I could keep talking on, on that, but I'll transition because you brought up the landlord insurance. So you could, you run into the same issues. Now I've been working with investors for a long time. Here's the problem with, property insurance or landlord insurance. Okay. One of them is, and it's the same thing when it comes to the vicious dogs, some of the companies will cover that. Some companies will not. Right. So you don't really know you have to dig down deep in your policy to really figure it out. Okay. So we wanted to provide a solution for property owners. And the solution is uh, making sure that vicious dog liability is covered. Okay. We also wanted to provide value to them. We already cover everything. We're turnkey operation. That's what people hate the most. Property owners is dealing with insurance because then they got to call their insurance agent. The insurance agent sends an inspector out and then they got to do this to the house and do that to the house. Right? So we sought out to find a solution 
to provide value to the owners at a lower cost um, to make sure that they didn't have to do all those nasty inspections. And, and we, you know, we found companies that specialize in it. That's all they do. I mean, they insure hundreds of thousands of properties across the United States because they know the market, right? So we've saved our landlords thousands of dollars by having a master policy. It works the same way as the renters master policy. We're the insured. Okay. And then the property owners, we add them to our policy and then we build them through the, uh, through the rents. Right. So their premium is taken out on a monthly basis. Big deal there. Their monthly basis controls their cash flow a little bit better. Uh, yes. and then there's an opportunity for the management company if they wanted to, to actually charge an admin fee. But the, from what I've seen and you're, what I'm kind of cutting you off a little bit is, you're seeing some of that cost actually a lot less than what they're seeing on the open market. Oh yeah. It's a lot less. Yeah. Because the insurance companies that do it, that's all they do. They're underwriters. They know the market. So they have the policy set up exactly how investors want and what they need. They know more than what they know more, what investors need and want than the investors themselves do. Because no one really wants to mess with insurance <laughs> and totally understand it because it can be very confusing. So the first thing someone's going to ask you is how does this work with somebody who has a escrow account? Because, uh, you know, some of these uh, VA loans, FHA loans, they may have had a primary resident, they're moving out. How does that work in doing a landlord insurance master policy with those types of things? Well, some of the companies, uh, quite frankly, they do not uh, handle those at all. It just needs to be on a monthly basis. So if you have a mortgage or the mortgage he pays, right, then mm -hmm. it's, they're just not going to be able to handle it. The companies that we work with, they do. So yeah. you could have 10 properties and all of them, uh, all of them, but one are just monthly basis and the other ones are mortgage he pays and, and they're making you pay it on an annual basis. The insurance company that we work through does that. So I bet a lot of times the mortgagee may not even care how the insurance is being paid. They're just more concerned that it is being paid. And so the, the actual insured, like the, the homeowner, would have to send in some sort of proof of payment for the insurance to the, the, the mortgagee. They don't, have, they don't have to do anything. Oh, the okay. Even better. Company, the insurance company, there's only two ways to do it. One is the mortgagee or bank makes you pay it annual through the escrow. Okay. Mm -hmm. So that's an annual basis. We handle that and we send them certificates saying, Hey, he's got insurance, right? Okay. Or they just want to make sure that they are covered. Right. And we send them a certificate and they, and the insured is responsible for paying it. Right. So we just pay it through, we, you know, renter's place actually pays the premium and then we bill the owner by taking it out of their rents. Mm -hmm. So they don't, I mean, it is a turnkey operation. They don't, the property owner, landlord does not have to do anything other than look at it and agree to be on the master plan. And the pricing that you offer is pretty simplistic. And I don't, I don't really want to get into math, but it's like, it's X times X equals your premium. And it, right. it's that easy. It, which is, which for investors, okay, that have multiple properties that are in the market of buying and selling, it's beautiful because you can, quite frankly, you just give them the formula mm -hmm. and they'll be able to research a house and know what their insurance costs are versus if you go to a state farm or a farmers, it depends on the zip code, location, is it brick, is it frame, all these different factors. So you can have a house next, I mean, right next to each other, two houses, right? And one, same size, everything. And one's more expensive than the other. And it just depends on the construction. So mm -hmm. one could be $700 a year, another one could be $1,000 a year. So it doesn't really make any sense, right, to the, the, to the consumer. But this one, it just allows you to have a formula and you know exactly what your costs are going to be. Yeah, the insurance companies, from what I understand, they're, they're treating it like we're the filter. You know, they're, they're using us as the gauge and the, the, the filter to bring on good customers. 
versus having to do any sort of, they don't do any sort of credit checks. They don't do any sort of uh, inspections. Yeah, no inspections, no credit checks, all right. of that stuff. So they're, they're using us as the filter to ensure they get quality customers. And we're the, actually the end customer, but uh, absolutely, how many particular policies we want is going to be up to us, the property management company. And, and that's really kind of up to them to make a business decision on how they offset those costs. Right. Particular clients. For, for the listeners out there, the best way to put this in layman's terms is a master policy. If you have four autos in your home, personal autos in your home, in the household, right? And you have it all in one policy and you get one monthly bill and you pay it. That is like a master policy, okay? It's, mm -hmm. it's that simple. So you have 100 property owners. They're all on your master policy. You're paying the premium and getting reimbursed through the rents and you're just handling it for them. So that's, that's all. It's like you own all those properties, although you don't. Right. Mm -hmm. And each property owner is listed as a named insured. So they're covered, you're covered. You don't have to worry about whether they have insurance and if rent works is an additional insured. Uh, I mean, it just, it covers everybody and protects the property manager. I'll tell you a little story here about that. So we've had some struggles with trying to get our landlords, our owners to name us additionally insured. Mm -hmm. So we created a surcharge in our property management agreement. And inside of this, it's an X dollar charge. We charge that to the owners until they get us a form that says we're named additionally insured. Right. And we tell them all the time, we don't want your money. We don't want any payment from this. We just want you to name us additionally insured. But if you don't, or you're lazy, or you don't want to call, or you just, you're afraid to go get a quote, then we will charge you X per month. And I could tell you the figures, but it's sickening. So I think we've had this program in effect for about a year plus, And I think we've got a hundred some owners paying it. And it's, it's yeah. really kind of stupid, Derek, but it really is. And yeah. it, I mean, it causes a little bit of dissension. I mean, um, it's, you know, and the thing about it is you want to know that they have insurance. You don't want, you want to know that if the claim happens, that if you get named in the lawsuit, that you're protected. Now, a lot of people don't know what that means. So let's dive back into that just a hair, because what happens when an owner has insurance and you're not named additionally insured? So let's say someone goes off the back deck and they slip and fall, and now there's going to be a lawsuit involved. They're going to go find an attorney, one of mm -hmm. those blood sucking ambulance chasing attorneys we all love. Yep. And they're going to come after you. They're going to come after your management company, Renner's Place, and they're probably going to go after the owner. Yes. Well, the owner's insurance will cover them with legal defense, but then you're going to have to defend yourself. Absolutely. So you'll have to hire your own attorney through renter's place. And then what happens when all that is said and done, what do you have to do to get that reimbursed? You're going to probably have to go from renter's place and go sue the owner to try your and client. <laughs> your client. You have to sue your client to get your fees and your attorney costs reimbursed because right. that's not your home. You're not responsible for that type of thing. That's just a bad luck of the draw for an owner having a tenant like that. And it could be something legitimate. Let's not, let's make it, let's make it a legitimate thing versus just somebody trying to get money. Uh, if it were a legitimate thing, then we have to provide our own defense outside of their defense and they're not talking. So the defense is one weaker. And then two, we end up having to sue our owner to get reimbursed. Right. And that, that's kind of ridiculous all at the same time. So again, we don't want that surcharge I was talking about. We don't want that at all. We just want the owners to name us additionally insured. So that was a challenge, but this master policy eliminates that. That's why I'm really liking it. Yes. And I mean, as you know, just from a business standpoint, and that's why you did the surcharge, it's not about what you gross. It's about what you net, right? And so the administrative cost of making sure, calling the owners to make sure you're listed as additional. There are time, I mean, there's time and money involved in that. It goes back to the same thing with the renter's insurance, making sure that the renters have you named as an additional insured on their policy and the landlords. You spend a lot of time on that, right? Mm -hmm. Especially if you're a larger property management company. I mean, it's, it can be a full-time job, right? Sure. So you could eliminate a $30,000, $40,000 uh, a year position 
just on that type of stuff if you're a larger property management company. Easily. Now I want to circle back a little bit and let's talk about how this ties into the bottom of the funnel, which I was talking about earlier, which is renting to animals on the property and being covered. So I did a podcast with John Bradford a few weeks ago and it was, he was introducing his new product called petscreening.com. Yeah, I've seen it. It's fantastic. It's a fantastic product. I think that's really going to revolutionize the industry and how we look at animals because what they do is they rank certain animals as a one through five paw score. And so let's say somebody applies with a one-year-old German shepherd, that one-year-old German shepherd could be a, let's say a one paw for fun. And so we would like to rent to that particular couple and put that animal. However, the homeowner's insurance says we can't, but if we can eliminate that, we can focus in on using the pet screening product. We can take that one-year-old German shepherd with a one paw. We can actually potentially come up with a animal risk mitigation fee Mm -hmm. where we can charge that just a little bit more because there's a little bit more risk involved in renting to a one-year-old German shepherd. You know, you know where I'm going. And it's not necessarily that they're going to attack somebody. It's going, they're going to, you know, they're big dogs and you can infer whatever you want to infer for whatever breed. I don't want to argue about breeds, but you can see where this is going. That's the bottom line is we want to be able to rent to all animals, but we got to ensure, you know, assure that our coverage is covered. Well, I'm, butchering that but let's we have to ensure our owners are covered because their insurance gives us certain stipulations that we have to abide by and by going outside of that we run the risk for them let's say we just rented to that one-year-old german shepherd and their insurance company finds out well they could get canceled like mid policy just like straight up canceled we found a german shepherd at your house and uh, uh somebody drove by from x company and we're canceling your policy effective now so right, what if right. they file a claim if a claim is filed they'll just deny it and then cancel your insurance. So we wanted to avoid all right. that. And this is, this is where we came up with this idea. And this ties in perfectly because the, the owner's master policy actually does tie into the tenant's master policy. So that those landlord and mm -hmm. tenant master policies, we just talked about two different factions of that. They tie in together to basically give you that opportunity that we just talked about. Does that, does that all make sense from, from both perspectives? Oh yeah. Here's what I love, you know, about, I mean, you have the front end and you have the back end, the front end, you do the pet screening, right? And you're through this with the tenant and, and then you're charging, you know, a risk mitigation, whatever you want to call it. Really you're setting the expectation and the precedent to the renter at that. This is serious. So you need to take care of your pet and make sure that they don't do any damage. Mm -hmm. Right. So you're setting it on the front end and on the back end is, okay, we want to make sure that the owner has coverage, that the tenant has coverage. So if the pet does do damage, right, then there's protection there as well. So you're setting the expectation with the tenant, right? And then you're covering the owner on the backside. Mm -hmm. And this would all be an approval of whoever we decide, we being the landlord and the property management company. Because, you know, if you want to discriminate against Datsuns because they mm -hmm. have the highest amount of claims, go ahead. And it doesn't mean you have to rent to snakes and, you know, skunks and other stuff. It just means right. you have the opportunity to, to apply your common sense and rent uh, on a basis of one, providing your landlord's coverage or opportunities to get coverage and two, uh, setting the expectations up front with your tenants that you have this coverage from there. So I think and, we'll talk about that at length. What else you got on that? Well, I was just going to say the, pre the precedent of you, of, of property managers doing that. So when issues come up and you probably know this as well as anybody, a service animal, I mean, it is, I mean, it's, it's an issue, right? But if you're setting your precedent, then of, of this is how you do things and you have a system for it, then the service animal becomes less of an issue. Yeah, that's, that's an interesting topic because the service animals, I just saw a blurb the other day that, uh, and I was reading the actual form from the state of Texas, is that if this causes undue financial hardship upon an owner to rent to a service animal, you could deny them. However, why do you want to go through that? Right. If they, if they run to the feds and say you are denied Boy, I, I, I don't know if I want to walk into that storm. You don't. <laughs> exactly. Because <laughs> imagine though, what it would take to defend that, even though if you're in the right, even if you're hiding behind a state form, uh, imagine trying to defend that against the feds for somebody who really wants to push that, 
down your throat. I mean, it, it could just be ugly. Well, yeah, think about the punitive damages because right now, I mean, why do they have a service animal? Yeah, yeah. To help we them with their ask. psyche and, 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 and makes them feel better or, you know, they have, I mean, there's all kinds of reasons why they have service animals, but it's so easy to get a service animal certificate. Mm -hmm. uh, so you're just, if, you know, if you deny them or you have some issues, then you're just, you're opening up a can of worms. And that really, uh, it's another thing I really like about the pet screening product is they ask the service animal questions yes. in, a, in a regimented, detailed uh, format to where you can't screw it up. I mean, they're yep. all questions that they've really researched and approved, and that is a, is a sure-fired uh, way to protect yourself versus one of your staff members asking, hey, why do you, why do you have a, a service animal? Are you, are you a nut job with PTSD? <laughs> you know, right. you just imagine that whole thing. Um, right. So... All right, I think we, we touched on that pretty good. I wanted to kind of split the other side of this episode and talk about specifically insurance for the management company themselves. Because uh, we talked about tenants and owners, we talked about how it ties into pet screening, and I think they all kind of go together. That gives us the opportunity there to potentially rent to any animals that we decide, as long as we can provide the landlord insurance and then we can make sure the tenants have their expectations set up front. All right, putting that off to the right-hand side, let's talk the left-hand side of the management company, Renters Place Incorporated, RentWorks LLC. What kind of type of insurance should we have? Okay, um, and before we put that to the side, I just want to make sure, and, and you know this, but Renters Place on the renter's master policy and providing that service and the landlord, because we've done it for years, right, and the landlord master policy, we... It, it's a revenue generator for us mm -hmm. thousands of dollars a month. Okay. And I think that's a great benefit to the property manager because there is administrative work, just not as much as they're doing now and they're actually making more money. So it's, you know, providing value and, and service and, and then making money at the same time. It's, it's a win-win. Okay. Going, I, Really, and, and we talked about this, we've talked about this before, you know, insurance and, and everyone knows this. I mean, you can talk to an insurance agent and they're going to like, you need this, 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 and this, and they give you all this stuff, right? So I want to come at it and just list things and, and just kind of go over them brief, briefly. And you have to, they, as a property manager, you have to decide, okay, are you going to look at it from the highest common denominator or the lowest? Okay. So the, basically the lowest coverage that I need or I want all these things, okay? So the first one that people really need to start with is a commercial general liability policy. It's pretty basic. Uh, it is, if someone comes into your office, they get hurt, you have insurance for it, okay? Mm -hmm. um, this is usually packaged together. They call them business owner policies. Um, and, and some of the things that you want on them are your contents, right? So if something happens and listen, everyone's got this because if they're leasing, then the, the, the uh, owner is going to make you have commercial general liability insurance. Okay. So you want uh, contents, you want commercial general liability limits of commercial general liability, uh, no less than a million dollars. Um, so that's pretty common stuff. Here's where it gets a little bit tricky with this, okay, is there's other coverages in there called personal and advertising injury. Some policies don't have that. I'd make sure that you have that because if you spend your time advertising and you're out there marketing, if you hurt someone's feelings or you say or do something wrong, then they come after you for that, then you want to make sure you have coverage for it, okay? Uh, products completed operations is another big one okay product completed operations is if you go out and do something and it's not done correctly and it causes damage, right so if you go out to a, an owner's house and you do something and fix a sink or light bulb or something like that and it causes damage to the house if you don't have product completed operations, you don't have any coverage. Interesting. So that's a lot of us because uh, just because we are organizing for maintenance repairs. Yes. That would basically insinuate that we are acting as some sort of general contractor. Absolutely. 
Absolutely. Yeah. And some uh, property managers, they might send a guy out uh, that doesn't work for them, but they might not have insurance, right? So you're still on the hook for that. Okay. So our company, one of the companies in it, they're, they do, they have a great property management. It's a package deal specifically made for property managers. They know their stuff. So they said, we do not provide product completed operations. So we get a separate policy that covers its contractual liability that covers product completed operations. Because now, is, we have, is that like errors and emissions insurance or no. is that like workers comp? So totally nope. different things. Totally different. Okay. We'll yeah. touch on those again, but I don't, I've never heard of the product completed operations one. You might have to look at my policy to see if I have some sort of coverage in there. Yeah. I mean, it's, it, it's part of the commercial general liability. It's, you, know, you have commercial general liability, you have med pay, you have content, you have personal and advertising injury, and you have products completed operations. And I'm looking at ours right now. Um, you can have, hired a non-owned auto, which I think is important to have. Mm -hmm. It's very inexpensive, very inexpensive. If you don't have a commercial liability, auto liability policy, you can get hired a non-owned auto on your commercial general liability policy. Mm -hmm. And that's if you send an employee somewhere, right? They're hired mm -hmm. or you have a uh, rent some type of car or equipment that you need, right? That's the uh, non-owned, right? And and um, and then something happens on the street and they get into an accident, then you're going to be covered, right? Yeah. So if you send out an employee and they're just using their personal car, right? But they're doing business and that uh, and they hit somebody and that person gets that attorney. They're going to sue you saying, well, they were on the job. Well, you're not listed if you're not listed as an additional insured on your employee's vehicle insurance, you better have hired an unknown auto. <laughs> yeah. Luckily a little side story on that to illustrate the point. Uh, we were actually sued a while back. This was a, a year ago uh, for an employee that only worked for us for a few weeks. And I'll, I'll get to the punchline here in a little bit. It's a well-known big attorney in, the, in this region, Thomas J. Henry, and they make a living going out and suing companies because of that million-dollar coverage that you just talked about. All the commercial companies in, in almost the entire state now carry that type of coverage. So the attorneys look at that with just like they're, they're salivating because they yes. know they can go get that for a truck driver or they know they can go get it from uh, any sort of delivery person, you know, even a pizza person. So anyway, an employee that we had for only a few weeks was driving home at 5.30 p.m. in the afternoon and rear end somebody in his personal vehicle, right? His personal car. Cops were called, police reports were filed. So about six months later, we ended up getting sued because of this because the person that the employee rear ended said that he was on the job and they were trying to sue us. So I had to be deposed, I had to go uh, deal with this. Our insurance did cover the claim, but at the end of the day, the, it was thrown out. The lawsuit was thrown out because the guy was on his way home from work in his personal vehicle. <laughs> yeah. But if he wasn't. But that's my point is, I'm, yeah. I'm going to make a point. These attorneys are far reaching. They were, they were just reaching. I mean, that's like just, hey, let's just throw it out there and see if they want to settle. Right. That's what they were doing. That's what it comes down to. They all want to settle. I mean, they might not have a chance, but they know the insurance company doesn't want to jack with it. So they might get $10,000 out of it. They filed. I mean, it took them 15 minutes to file and they're splitting it with the client and they make 5,000 bucks over 15 minutes worth of work. Yeah. So sort of, disgusting. It's, Absolutely it's, disgusting. The world we live in, my friend. So talk to me about uh, a lot of us are licensed realtors and slash brokers in the property management industry. Talk to us about errors and emissions insurance. And I'll give you my two cents. So I am not required to have errors and emissions insurance because I own more than 10% of this company. And that's the state of Texas rule. Uh, however, I do carry it because I think it is a smart thing and it does cover those transactions that may go south. So do you yeah. guys carry that stuff? Do you recommend it? What do you think? Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. If you're a professional, another name for Eno is professional liability. If you're a professional, um, and providing a professional service, uh, I think it's, you should do it, right? And it's really not that expensive. Um, 
I, in 25 years, I've never had an errors and emissions claim. I've never had any of my clients have an errors and emissions claim. So it's not widely used. And I think you're right from a property management standpoint that, you know, the risk is a lot less. Now, if you're brokering and doing all that stuff, then absolutely you need it. And you need, uh, you know, to list all your agents that you have working for you on it. I'll, I'll tell you from a property management standpoint, what's much more, well, I say more important. It's hard to say that from an insurance standpoint, but we carry commercial general liability. We carry the products and completed operations. We're, AKA contractual liability. We carry, and this is a really important for us, tenant discrimination liability. Okay. That's the next one I want to touch on because I had it on my list to talk about the fair housing stuff. So is that kind of what that is? Yes. Yep. Okay. Keep yep. going. Ten tenant discrimination liability. You walk in when you're not supposed to, they sue you Ten tenant discrimination. You uh, don't lease to someone, they sue you you got tenant discrimination liability. Well, you win or lose is a different deal, but at least you have some coverage limits for that, right? And you have mm -hmm. someone defending you, and that's important. I think that's important to have. It's really not that expensive. I mean, mm -hmm. maybe 500 bucks a year, right? Okay. Um, the other thing that we carry, we carry, uh, it's called EPLI. It's Employees Professional Liability Insurance. And if you have employees, you need to have it. And that's the employee suing you for discrimination, sexual right. harassment, stuff like that. Right. It's, again, it's not very expensive. And I get that all these add up and your total premium, right. Gets to be more expensive. So you just have to decide your business, what's best for your business, what kind of business you have, the bigger you are, the more employees you have, you need more insurance. That's yeah. You're just, just a bigger target. That's just the nature of the beast, right? You got to have workers' compensation. That's usually oh. state, state law mandate that if you have employees, you have to have workers' compensation. So tell me more about that because that's that's a big one. A lot of people think that's very expensive, and it probably could be. And uh, so I really want to learn more about the workers' comp because that's probably the big two or three that people think about is your your basic, you know, your your general liability type policy, your commercial business owner policy. And then they also think about, well, should I have workman's comp because I might have a tech or I might have, uh, I, you know, I, I GC this whole thing. So maybe I need workers comp. Tell me more about that because if your, if your vendors carry it, then you may not need it, but are you sure your vendors carry it on every case? Uh, yeah, this is a big contentious point. Uh, if you have employees, then it, you, you have work. I mean, you got to have workers comp. Okay. Where it gets a little sticky in our business is, you're sending out vendors, right? So for instance, say HVAC, you have an HVAC tech that actually works for you as an employee, then you need to have workers comp. And it gets more expensive. The bigger you get, the more expensive, right? Mm -hmm. Office staff, stuff like that, administrative, that's, it's, it's, the premiums are low. But you get into guys that go outside, that they're doing HVAC stuff, plumbing stuff, it gets more expensive, okay? But where it can get real expensive is, if you don't make sure that your vendors have workers' comp insurance, and this differs by state, right? Or they're exempted from it, and we have, a, we keep a list, and we make sure that they either have a certificate of insurance, or that they are exempt, and they're providing something from the state that they are exempt. Mm -hmm. And we have their vendors sign a vendor contract saying, you're supposed to have this, and they sign off on it. So, because if they don't, and let's say it's a vendor that you love, they do great work, blah, blah, blah. You want to send them out and they haven't renewed or whatever happens, then you're going to get audited on your workers comp. And then they're going to charge you for, uh, for that vendor, like they're an employee. So that's where it can, if you don't stay on top of it, it can get very expensive. Right. Wow. We, Hey, we battle it here all the time. I mean, it's just, I mean, we have, we have great contractors, you know, those individual guys that do great work and they're loyal, but you know, insurance is not on the, you know, it's not a high priority. Sure, for them. Sure. <laughs> let's talk about some of the, uh, let's talk about some of the boutique coverages out there. Like uh, one I threw down was cyber liability. 
So is that covered somewhere inside of your commercial liability or is that something that somebody should go out and specifically get on their own? Um, and what, let, me, let me try to clarify that a bit more. We're always going to be worried about money disappearing. Like let's say that we're trying to send out an owner draw and you send it out for X dollars and uh, it just disappears because somebody got into your bank account and committed fraud and the bank says, it's not our problem, it's your problem. Uh, then we're like, okay, well, we're out this big X and that big X could be, you know, five, six, seven, eight, fig, you know, six, seven figures, yeah. let's say. Uh, what are you going to do? I mean, so. Well, that is, yeah, that is not cyber liability. Uh, that is crime insurance. Uh, a, another way is you, so you can get crime insurance and it's a fiduciary because you're handling money and it is a fiduciary responsibility to keep accurate records and not lose money and all that good stuff. So you can get crime insurance or you can get a fidelity bond. Fidelity and, bond. Okay. Yeah. Fidelity bond. And it's you're just basically paying for a bond saying that, Hey, if I do something wrong, I do something to lose some money. Right. We don't actually have that. Uh, we've, I like it uh, because I think it is our responsibility. Maybe I have a little bit, too much faith in our staff and how we do things, <laughs> but mm -hmm. it has been pushed upon us because we deal with some private investors, large investors, private equity groups. And you, if you manage any properties for uh, groups like that, they're going to require you to have that. Mm -hmm. We were able to negotiate out of it. Um, it's not horribly expensive, but I mean, it's just an, you know, it's another expense for sure. So you have to keep that in mind when, if you're pricing um, your property management fees or, you know, dealing with private equity groups, you know, large institutional investors that you have, you know, built that in for that extra cost because they're going to require it. Okay. Let's talk this in easy terms. So, let's consider talking must haves and should haves. The must haves are gonna be the startups, the brand new companies, the smaller companies, uh, the mom and pop. Let's talk must have. So give me a must have list of insurance that that type of company needs to have. Well, the, all the stuff that we talked about before and I got the list right here. Okay, so you have, if you have employees, you, got, you have to have workers comp, period, okay. right? So that's the first one. If you don't, then you don't. Um, second is, your commercial general liability, and that needs to include your personal advertising um, injury, okay. product completed operations. Those two things, okay. I also, uh, and, and, and then, so that's the most lowest common denominator of coverage. The next is if you have employees, would be workers comp, EPLI, mm -hmm. Um, let me think through this. I want to make sure. Oh, and the hired and non-owned auto. The auto, because you're going to have potentially also company vehicles in there as you get going. Right, right. So there should and, have. And, and a good way around that actually is, and it depends on what state you're in. In Oklahoma, personal insurance, personal auto insurance is very expensive. Mm -hmm. So you can actually get a commercial liability auto policy that might be the same or less than your personal auto and usually a commercial auto liability policy is going to carry more coverage. So you're paying the same or less and getting more coverage, which will have the hired and non-owned auto. Right? So it's smart for the business owners to actually run their vehicles through the company. Right. Gotcha. They can run gotcha. it on the books. They can get it insured off the company and actually get insurance through the company. That makes sense. Cause we were just gotcha. looking at that ourselves. Now the should have, so you got the established company, you know, let's say they manage a lot of homes, you know, 500 plus, 1,000 plus. Uh, what do you think they should have for fun? Um, definitely professional liability, mm -hmm. your errors and emissions, your tenant discrimination liability. And I put the tenant discrimination liability actually on a must have. Okay. Um, and it, it's just, it's a little bit harder to find packaged with your commercial general liability, right? Mm -hmm. So you have to find that. Um, so you have a professional liability, another term for that's error and emissions. I, I, I believe, I mean, that's right there on the edge of must have, you know, mm -hmm. depending, I mean, listen, a lot of property managers, they're doing some buying and selling, right? So if they're yeah. doing any of that, then they definitely need to have that. And if um, something really went south on a management deal, 
um, you know, people that are, are saying that you didn't do something where you should have. I mean, that, that could come into play in that E&O claim. Yes. So I could see that. So I like what we've been talking about here and I want you to. Yeah, there, it's all going to come out in that part. Good. Yep. So let's, let's kind of wrap this up a little bit. I like what you've been talking about here. This has been a great episode because you're giving us a lot of insurance knowledge in a, in a brief amount of time and the must haves and should haves for the company insurance has been invaluable. The master policy information for the landlord and the tenants have been great. I really enjoyed that. And I think at the end of the day, we'll be able to rent to more applicants, more approved applicants, being able to open up to the pet situation a little bit better, pet and animals. So Derek, now if someone were to get in, wanted to get in touch with you about reviewing their business, reviewing their processes, what would be the best way to reach out to you? We have, we have, I have a website and that's usually the, you know, they could go there. Uh, it's insurance. The name of the company is insurance management group. It's imgadvisors.com. Um, imgadvisors.com. Okay. Yes. They can also contact me at Derek D E R R I C K at imgadvisors.com. Perfect. And I, I mean, listen, I deal with a lot. I mean, they call me on my cell phone. I mean, mm -hmm. it's, you know, I just, I think it's important after going to a lot of property management conferences that there's not a real great education on insurance, on what the property manager needs and actually what's best for the owner and uh, the tenant. And yeah. so, I mean, I've talked to a lot of really prominent property managers and they just, I mean, they don't want to know insurance. They don't want to understand insurance but you need to understand your business and your business model and what you're there for. And that is the value that you provide and the protection you provide owners and tenants. Agreed. So it's, it's, Agreed. it's easy to do. It's easy to yeah. do. It doesn't have to be hard. Perfect. So anybody needs to get in touch with you, they go to imgadvisors.com. They can email you to Derek at imgadvisors.com. And uh, hopefully that will be enough information. We'll put it in the, in the show notes as well so they can reference it. That'll sure. be a good way for them to get in touch with you because they could have a almost a complete review of their insurance by you and your team. And you can uh, offer them some opportunities to upgrade or get the right stuff that they need because you understand the management business. And I will tell you from personal experience that uh, the last quote I got from my local insurance company, uh, I think they understand me, but the, the company they're getting the insurance through does not. Mm -hmm. Some of the questions they were asking me just did not apply. Right. And so we were trying to have, we were had a hard time explaining to them that this is what we do. And so it got a little frustrating. I, I don't think they even understood us because they thought we were just a regular real estate company. You know, we're, we're, or we're all transactional model based, but we're not, we, we do a uh, different things. So fantastic episode, Derek, any parting words? No, I just want to thank you for the opportunity to, I've been trying to get on here. Finally got on here. You got love, it, your, love, love your shows, love your shows and, and I appreciate it. And, and I hope that the information that, you know, we talked about is useful to the listeners out there. Very valuable. Very, very valuable. Thanks Derek for coming on. So we'll talk to you soon. Take care. Okay. See you, Brad. This has been a podcast episode by property management productions.com. Be sure to subscribe to our podcast, leave us feedback and come back for our next episode. 